Good evening, everyone. We'll let you get your seat. Welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Nicole Smith, um, Director of Library and Archives here at the York County History Center. Uh, unfortunately, Adam Betts was unable to be here this evening, so I'm filling in for him. Um, just a couple of announcements about upcoming programs at the History Center before we get started. Um, let's see. This Thursday at seven o'clock, there is a webinar on Pennsylvania canals with Matt Maris. That's that would be on our website and my Facebook page. You can check that out. Uh, December first, Thursday is our writers roundtable. The speaker is Greg Halpin, and he'll be speaking about Old Sue's York's first steam fire engine. On Sunday, December 4th, our South Central Pennsylvania Genealogy Society will have their Share Your Findings open house. And on second Saturday, we will have a program on Latino history in York with Jim McClure. Um, for more information um, about our programs or to register, please visit yorkhistorycenter.org. I'm going to turn this over to Scott Rudd now. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. For all those who are watching out there on the internet, um, really have a great uh, program for you this evening. Really looking forward to it. Uh, be, but before that, we are going to also do a few announcements. As many of you know, this weekend, uh, with it being November 19th, is Dedication Day in Gettysburg. And it, because it's Saturday, it also is Remembrance Day. So they're having a bunch of events in Gettysburg that day. Uh, you can go to uh, Destination Gettysburg website and you'll see some of the events they have there. Here with our roundtable, uh, just to let everyone know, in January and February next year, as we start our 2023 campaign, during those months, the early winter months, due to possible weather issues, we are going to have those two months only on Facebook Live and Zoom. So just to make you aware of that, we will resume our in-house hybrid programs in March. Next month, uh, our first uh, online program is going to be with Scott Mangus and Eric Wittenberg covering their new book, If We're Striking for Pennsylvania. It's the first of a two volume series that they're gonna have about the movement of the armies of Northern Virginia and the Potomac up toward Gettysburg and their campaign. Um, their description says that General Robert E. Lee began, began moving part of his army from the Old Dominion toward Pennsylvania on June 3rd, and he believed that his army needed to win a major victory on northern soil if the South was to have a chance of winning the war. Transferring the fighting out of war-torn Virginia would also allow the state time to heal while he supplied his army from untapped farms and stores in Maryland and Keystone State. They also convinced President Jefferson Davis that his offensive would interfere with the Union efforts to take Vicksburg and Mississippi. The bold movement would trigger extensive cavalry fighting and a major battle of Winchester before culminating in the body free about three day battle of Gettysburg. And as the army, of, as the Virginia army moved north, the army of the Potomac responded by protecting vital roads to DC in case Lee turned to threaten the capital. Opposing presidents, Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis, Meanwhile, kept a close watch on the latest and often conflicting military intelligence gathered in the field. Throughout Northern Virginia, Central Maryland, South Central Pennsylvania, meanwhile, civilians and soldiers alike struggled, struggled with the reality of a mobile campaign and the massive logistical needs of the armies. Thousands left written accounts of the passage of the long martial columns. Scott Mangus is familiar to those of us here at the York Roundtable, he's one of our members and one of our popular speakers. He's spoken here many times. Uh, he's the author of more than 30 books on the Civil War and the Underground Railroad, and he's spoken about those topics here before. His book, uh, his biography of Confederate General Extra Billy Smith, won the James I. Robertson Jr. Award for Confederate History. Eric Wittenberg is a, a, an accomplished 
Civil War uh, cavalry historian, published nearly two dozen books on various Civil War subjects, with a particular focus on cavalry operations. In his first book, Gettysburg's Forgotten Cavalry Actions won the prestigious 1998 Beck Elder Coddington Literary Award. So we definitely look forward to that program at the beginning of the year in January. And more, more of that, about that will be coming as we get closer to the event with the uh, where to connect with Zoom and Facebook. Tonight, uh, we're going to wrap up the 2022 campaign with a looks like a very, very appropriate topic for this evening. As I said, 19th of this month, just so Saturday, is the anniversary of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. So we're, we are going to be talking about Lincoln Comes to Gettysburg. And we wel welcome Dr. Bradley and Linda Gottfried to speak about that. Uh, Dr. Gottfried is, uh, he earned a PhD in zoology and served as a college educator for over 40 years. And he rose to the presidency of two colleges before he retired and has written 17 books on the Civil War. And he's a Gettysburg town guide and an attentive licensed battlefield guide. And Linda Gottfried, earned a BFA and served as a graphic designer and development officer at several colleges and nonprofit organizations before retiring in 2015. And she now spends her time as a sculptor and enjoying retirement. And several of her pieces have won awards as well. So let's welcome Brad and Linda Godfrey as they present their program, Lincoln Comes to Gettysburg. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here. I want to thank Kate for her wonderful emails and for arranging uh, my visit. We live in Fayetteville, so it's not too bad. Last night, as I was going, Kate, we were at State College, um, where we got about, what, two inches of snow, wet snow. It was their holiday dinner party. Um, they were expecting over 50 individuals, but 30 actually weathered the storm. I was a little surprised at that. Um, and I've spoken before, I'm trying to remember, I think twice on Zoom, if I'm not mistaken, at least once. One book out in January. Yes. And so uh, this book, as you mentioned, is very appropriate. By the way, what's your name? I'm sorry. Scott. Right Scott, right. yes. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Very appropriate for me to be here this evening to talk about Lincoln Comes to Gettysburg. This is part of the Emerging Civil War series. You're probably familiar with it. We decided, uh, Linda and I, to uh, work with uh, uh, Chris. Chris Michalski, thank you, uh, because there have been other books on the creation of the National Cemetery and Lincoln's visit, but most of them, as you know, are rather on the thick side. And a lot of people aren't really interested in diving into the topic in that kind of detail. We decided we wanted to put something together that was an easy read, that people could really understand um, the impact and how difficult it was to create this national cemetery. Um, but what happened was, it's interesting, I'm going to talk about the first part tonight, mainly the formation of the national cemetery. And then, I think you've all been to the um, Seminary Ridge Museum. Uh, I just went over there and did the second part, which is actually Lincoln and his seminal visit when he came and uh, helped to dedicate the cemetery. And our next book in the Emerging Civil War series, by the way, I should put in a plug for it, is, and I got myself in a little trouble. It is, uh, it doesn't have a title yet. It is, um, Lee's Retreat After Gettysburg slash Meets Pursuit. And I made the mistake, I went to a Sons of the Confederate Veterans meeting. I spoke there and I casually mentioned, I just sort of threw it out, Lee's Retreat. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it was the worst thing. I, I'm surprised they didn't run me out of town. It was not a retreat. It was a strategic uh, movement back to Virginia. <laughs> okay, whatever. So I always mention this. Uh, Linda, I did the writing, Linda did the graphics. Uh, we usually flip a coin, who is going to talk and give the presentation, and I won. So you've got me tonight. 
Uh, and I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Many of you may know many of the things that I'm going to be talking about. So we have to talk, first of all, about the dead. You know, um, largest battle in terms of number of casualties, over 8,000 men lying in the fields in the hot July sun. And we, you know, we have to get them buried as quickly as possible. They're becoming bloated. There are pigs and other animals that are kind of hungry when a feast on their flesh. You have uh, flies who are landing on them and laying their eggs and guess where these flies are going after they're going right into gettysburg and they're landing on the civilians and who knows what they're doing to them um so there, there were a number of reasons to get these men buried as quickly as possible and as you know they're not going to have the ability to to bury them individually six foot graves are going to be long trenches buried maybe maybe two to three feet deep and after a big rainfall, you know what happens. You're going to see uh, a number of body parts exposed. And it's a real problem. So we have two heroes. And I knew quite a bit about David Wills. I didn't know much about uh, Andrew Curtin as governor. And how many of you are familiar with Andrew Curtin, by the way? OK, I think we all should. We talk about war presidents. We talk about Lincoln being a war president, a very effective war president. Uh, Andrew Curtin was a very effective war governor. He's someone who's going to spend a lot of time preparing Pennsylvania for a, a possible invasion. He's going to be calling out the militia. And what's interesting, if you read the correspondence, and I'm getting a little bit far afield, but what the heck? Um, if you read the correspondence between Curtin and um, Couch, Darius Couch, who commands the Department of the Susquehanna, and Edwin Stanton. And what does he say that infuriates a Secretary of War Stanton? You know, all these young men that were recruiting to be in the Army of the Potomac, well, you're not getting them. They're going to, the, um, to our militia. And that just drove Stanton crazy. But this is a man who has just been reelected governor to a second term. It's about 46 years old. It is so stressful. He's actually going to have a nervous breakdown in early June. But he is going to be one that really takes it upon himself to make sure that the state is prepared and after to make sure the state is recovering from this ordeal. So he's going to come to Gettysburg on July the 10th. He wanted to come sooner, wasn't able to, it wasn't the opportunity. He doesn't really want to tour the battlefield like, like others would like to do. He wants to do two major things. Well, actually one major. And that is, he wants to talk to the civilians of Gettysburg. He wants to make sure that their health is okay, that they're doing okay. Is there anything that he can provide to them? But as also, as he, his, he's, uh, and he does go on the battlefield, uh, as he does ride around the battlefield, he's going to see all of these trenches being dug. But also, well, I, mean, I guess by that time, they've all been dug. But he's going to see a number of headstones. You know how, let's say you have a son that you, or that you fought next to, and he unfortunately was killed. You're not going to let him be buried in a trench, a shallow trench. You're going to dig, if you can, a proper grave for him. And you're going to put a, a, a board by his head that simply gives his name and his unit. And as Andrew Curtin is riding around, he's seeing that these boards are starting to fade and it's really starting to concern him. Now he's accompanied by a young man, and I think we've all seen his house, many of us have been in his house, a beautiful house, David Wills, who's a 30, he's about 32 year old attorney. He's a Republican as is Andrew Curtin. And he's going to accompany Andrew Curtin during his visit to Gettysburg. And as Andrew Curtin gets back to get on the train, he's going to do something that David Wills will regret. And that is he's going to make him the Pennsylvania agent. And what does a Pennsylvania agent do? Well, let's say you've lost a son. Maybe um, uh, you know he's dead. 
and you'd like to have them buried in the family plot. So you can contact David Wills, and he will try to track down where the body is. He'll try to get it exhumed, embalmed, put into a coffin, and sent home to you. Uh, maybe you've lost, uh, maybe a relative you knew was wounded, but you don't know where he is or, or what the extent of his wounds are. And you can write, you can send a telegram to David Wills as the agent for Pennsylvania to say, well, I don't know anything about my son or my, or my father. Um, I think I heard that he might have been wounded. Where is he? And what's the extent of his injuries? And it can take days for each of these cases to be adjudicated until he can figure things out. So he's going to be working almost 24-7. Now, there's going to be an agent appointed by every governor in every state where there were young men fighting this battle, Minnesota, Massachusetts, Maine, etc. So he's one of 18. And, and this is what he's going to write later on, as you can see, an undertaking of much greater magnitude than I ever contemplated. Talk about an understatement. Well, what's going to happen is... There is an agent from New York. His name is Dr. Theodore Diamond. And he is actually, he's like the assistant agent because the governor's brother, Governor Seymour's brother, um, is going to be the, the actual agent for New York. And he apparently, by the way, um, Dr. Diamond had been a medical surgeon, had been an army surgeon before he um, resigned his commission. So now he's helping with the, being an agent in Gettysburg to help in the, the same kinds of things I mentioned you would do in terms of Pennsylvania, trying to identify where men are, et cetera, their fate. And apparently he is going to ask David Wills to set up a meeting in his law office on the square and invite as many of the agents as possible to come and to participate in this meeting. And David, and and. Uh, Theodore Diamond is going to write later on, and you can read this, that it seemed wrong to leave this soldier buried like a dead horse when in another year all marks of his grave would be obliterated by the owner of the soil. I'm reading it because of, I don't know how many people on, in Zoom are able to read the screen. But anyway, there's a little controversy. Whose idea really was it? Was it David Wills? Was it Theodore Diamond? Well, if you talk to Theodore Diamond, he's going to say it was my idea. If you talk to David Wills, mm, he might just say, yeah, it was my idea. doesn't really matter. The main thing is the idea came up. It was embraced by the group. Let's have a national cemetery. Now, how many national cemeteries are there in the country? Anyone know? One, five. 20. 400. How many? 400. You're close. Actually, it's about 130. <laughs> but I mean, most people would say five or six. So to come up with a large number, you're right in that regard. Um, but during this time, you had Arlington being formed, but that was about it. And so this was kind of a revolutionary idea. What's also interesting, I know I'm going to forget this, <laughs> is we call it the Soldiers National Cemetery. National Cemetery. Did Washington, did Lincoln have anything to do with the planning, funding, implementation of this cemetery? No. It was all the states are the, the ones working together to make this happen. Anyway, it doesn't really matter whose idea it was. David Wills, though, is going to write to Governor Curtin on July 24th, and he's going to say, hey, how about we have a national cemetery? And to uh, his credit, uh, Andrew Curtin does not have to be convinced. He's been around the battlefield. He understands the need for a national cemetery. And he embraces the idea. And he says, the state of Pennsylvania will pay for the land. Now, there's going to be the total cost over and above is going to be about $80,000. It's going to be shared by the states on a proportional basis, depending on how many congressmen they had, but that's later on. Okay, so we got the idea, great. We now need to determine where it's going to be. 
Now, can you, any, you, we've all been to Gettysburg, right? Obviously, we've all been to the cemetery, right? Can you imagine a better place for a cemetery on that battlefield than Cemetery Hill? I can't. And that is the place that David Will said, yes, this is where it ought to be. Well, he's got a little problem, though, because he has a neighbor. His name is David McConaughey. And David McConaughey has a lot in common with David Wills. They're both attorneys. They both are Republicans. They're both pillars of their community. But they hate each other. They absolutely hate each other. Now, how many of you have on Chambersburg Street are aware of the restaurant Mama Ventura's? Okay, that's where David, that's where David McConaughey, that's where his law office was, that's where he lived. And you know how close it is. It's like a block away from the David Wills house. So they lived very close, but they did not interact with each other at all before the war and after the war because they, they just had a dislike of each other. But David McConaughey has a problem that's keeping him up at night. And that problem is he is the president of the Evergreen Cemetery Association. And that association is not doing very well financially. In fact, it's about ready to go under. And he comes up with this wonderful idea. He hears about the National Cemetery being formed. Ah, why don't we make sure that that cemetery is within the confines of Evergreen Cemetery? We're never going to have another financial issue after that. And so he starts buying up land. He's going to make get commitments from these um, landowners who own land around Cemetery Hill. They all agree. And he's, he's sitting pretty, pretty well. Well, here's the problem. David Wills is valuing Cemetery Hill, the same land, and he's up against McConaughey, who already has commitments. And McConaughey is not saying, oh, it's going to be a standalone separate uh, cemetery. He's saying, it's going to, I'm going to expand Evergreen, which David Wills said, absolutely not. That is not going to happen. And so what happens is you have a controversy. Now, if you're governor of Pennsylvania, what's the last thing you want to do? Get in the middle of two influential Republicans, but that's where they put them. Both of them are tugging, you know, support me, support me. And this is how bad it gets. And, you know, I, I, I really respect David Wills, but he did some things that are a little bit on the shady side. And one of the things I want you to imagine you're David McConaughey, okay? And you have commitments, verbal commitments to buy land on Cemetery Hill. You get on the train, you go to Harrisburg, you're going to talk to the governor to get him to embrace your, your idea. And while you're gone, guess what David Wills is doing? He's knocking on doors of those landowners saying, forget about that commitment, sell the land to me. So how would you feel when you learned that's what your competitor was doing? You wouldn't be very happy about it. And that adds to the anim animosity. <laughs> well, the governor does not want to be in the middle of these two very powerful, very supportive Republicans. He needs to keep their, their support. So what do you do? You bring in mediators. And by the way, I, I should tell you, that David Wills was so furious about this controversy and this fight with McConaughey that he says, the heck with it. Um, I'm going to move that idea for the cemetery, not to Cemetery Hill, but to Seminary Ridge. Could you imagine if the seminary were on, if the cemetery was on Seminary Ridge? Cemetery Ridge. It wouldn't have worked. It, it wouldn't have the dynamic nature it has today. Um, and what's even more interesting is Mc the governor is going to side with David Wills. He's going to say it shouldn't be part of Evergreen Cemetery. I appreciate this, David McConaughey, but no. And McConaughey apparently says to David Wills, or at least to the governor, because I don't think he's talking to David Wills, I will sell the land that I have a commitment for to for the same price that I paid for it, which is $200 an acre. And David Wilson, the heck with it. I don't want it. We're going to move that cemetery. Kind of spiteful. 
Well, many of the influential citizens of Gettysburg knew the best place, the only place to place this cemetery is Cemetery Hill. And so they're writing telegrams and letters to the governor saying, don't let him move it. It's got to be on Cemetery Hill. And what is the governor? The governor doesn't have time for this nonsense. And so he's going to appoint two influential individuals, both Republicans, to mediate. Um, David Beeler, who is the postmaster of Gettysburg. And you all know about Edward Von Stock with his brother's owns the dry goods stores on Baltimore Street. And they, you can't even have McConaughey and Wills in the same room. They won't even go in the same room together. So they will mediate, they'll actually go back and forth different rooms to try to make sure that they get this compromise settled. Finally, the agreement is fine. No Evergreen Cemetery will be involved. All of the land that McConaughey has purchased is going to be um, transferred to this, um, to this, um, uh, to Wills's enterprise. And everything's fine, but it didn't, it left a really bad taste in the mouth of many individuals because McCon because Wills, during this whole issue, during this whole controversy, is, is really bad mouthing McConaughey. He's a speculator. He's, he's trying to make a profit on this. He's a scoundrel, when in fact, none of this was really true. I mean, yes, he's trying to protect Evergreen Cemetery. And what would it be like if we didn't have an Evergreen Cemetery today? I mean, it's a beautiful cemetery. And talk about history of Adams County. I mean, it's a who's who of, of who uh, lived and died there. Anyway, that's wrong. It's only 12 acres. 12 acres at about $200 an acre. Okay, so we've got the land. Uh, we've got the concept. What do we need next? We need the concept. We need the conceptual drawing of this cemetery. And David Wills is pretty smart. I mean, he's, he is very shrewd. He's going to go to Washington. And, um, and it's probably actually uh, Andrew Curtin who's going to make the introductions because what happened during the election uh, during this time, I guess it was 1862, what happened to the, what was the largest Republican state before the election of 1862? It was New York. But in 1862, they're going to uh, elect a Democratic governor, Horatio Seymour. So Pennsylvania becomes the largest state, Republican state in the union. And Curtin understands the importance of this. He's going to go periodically to meet with Lincoln and see what kind of goodies he can get from him. And I suspect that one of the things he asked Lincoln to do was to allow this gentleman, William Saunders, worked for the USDA. He was the head of the horticulture area. But he's a landscape architect. He helped to design Central Park. Beautiful. We've all, many of us have been to Central Park, beautiful facility. Can we borrow him? And they said, sure. And so he will be delegated to come to Gettysburg to meet with David Wills. They will walk the ground. And he says, wow, he says, I've got, I can, I can see it. I can feel it. It's going to be wonderful, the cemetery. But it's too small. I need five more acres. Can you get me five more acres? I need it to be 17. I need to round it out somewhat. And David Wills is going to be able to do that for him. So it's actually going to be 17 acres. And we've all been to the National Cemetery, right? You know how wonderful and how moving an experience it is, how the graves are arranged by state. Now, even that was a controversy because he's going to be not fighting disagreeing with uh, William Saunders, this is David Wills, he wants to bury the dead by unit. So all the first corps men will be buried together and all the 12th corps and Saunders is going to get his way and it's going to be by state. And what's interesting, how many of you have been to the Antietam National Cemetery? Okay, you'll see similarities. It looks very similar, the semicircle by state um, borrowing from what you find at Gettysburg. 
um, you know, it becomes an arboretum. In fact, he had so many design elements that were just wonderful. When you, how many times have we been there? It never ceases to move us, no matter how many times we're there. And this is because of William Saunders and his, uh, his activities. Okay, we've got the land, we've got the design. Oh, I should mention one more thing. William Saunders is going to get a invitation to the executive mansion, the White House. And he's asked to come on November the 17th to meet with President Lincoln. And imagine President Lincoln sitting next to William Saunders. And by the way, William Saunders is an immigrant from Scotland. He's got the map the design spread on Lincoln's lap. And they're and they're, he, uh, Saunders is describing all the design features. Why? Because Lincoln is thinking, I'm coming to Gettysburg to help set, uh, to dedicate this cemetery. I need to have a better sense of, of what I'm going to be helping to dedicate. Okay. All right. What do we have to do next? We have to let, let, let a contract, award a contract to move the dead. All these other activities have been fairly easy, but this one, holy cow, this is going to be difficult. Um, because think about it. These men have been in the ground in these trenches for months. And so you have to have a group of men or women, but it's usually men, going to be um, digging up these, these corpses, trying to identify them, and once they identify them, they're going to put the name of the corpse on the, on the lid of the coffin with his unit. They're going to place, carefully place the corpse in the coffin, seal the coffin, put it on a wagon, send it to the National Cemetery, and where it's going to be interred very carefully, okay, with very meticulous records so we know who is buried where. This is not going to be easy. But David Wills has no patience. He knows I got to get this moving as fast as possible. And this is what's so fascinating. This is an advertisement that was in the Gettysburg Sentinel, the Republican newspaper. And if you look at the lower left, you see it's, Octo it's printed on October 15th. You see that? When are the contracts, the bids due? They're due on the 22nd. So you're talking about one week He's giving these these um, these bidders to to crunch some numbers, figure out can I even do this? I've got almost four thousand men. I'm going to be moving, and the craziest thing is the first burials will begin on the twenty seventh. I mean, talk about boom, boom, boom. We're talking fast, and uh, Wills is not going to let this go for any length of time. Now. Well, let me go back if I could. He's going to get over 30 um, proposals. They will range from about $1.59 to $8. Now think about it. If I'm bidding it, I'm probably going to go higher. Although $8 back then, that was a lot of money. The low bid was submitted by a local man by the name of Frank Weisinger. And he knew, David Wills knew David Weiss, uh, knew uh, Frank Weisinger and respected him and said, if he thinks he can do it for $1.59, he got it, he's got it. And I think that's one of the reasons why they could start the process of, of removing the bodies and reburying them so quickly because you had a local guy involved. So uh, he is not going, Weisinger is not going to get his hands dirty. He's going to hire two individuals to, who are going to oversee the entire process. Samuel Weaver, we've all heard of Samuel Weaver. He is the superintendent of exhuming the bodies. So he is the one, in fact, we have this iconic photograph. Um, and most of the men who are going to be digging up the bodies and reburying them are people of color. Uh, but he has an onerous task. He's not going to, he's not, he doesn't touch his shovel, but he has to identify the dead. Now, if many of them are going to have a canteen or a knapsack, it's going to have their name on it and their unit. That's easy. 
but many of them, there's no outward indication of who they are, what unit they were fighting for, but they've got a bulge in their pocket. Now, it's December. Those guys have been in the ground for five, six months. Do you want to stick your hand in their pocket? I certainly wouldn't. And so he devises, a, he improvises a hook, a metal hook, that he's able to put into their pocket, pull out the contents, and he's able to identify a number of men that way, especially if they were writing in, in pencil. Um, now, so after they're identified, he's going to get them onto a uh, onto the wagon and take them over where James Townsend will have his own crew, and he is a superintendent of burials. Now they've already dug these graves six feet deep. You've all seen them uh, where the graves are, are buried or where the graves are, and he is going to supervise very carefully lowering the coffin into the ground. Burying it, keeping meticulous records. Okay. Um, now, David Wills is, yeah, he wants this to happen, but he is very concerned about what my mother would always say a slapdash approach. Imagine if, if uh, um, Frank Weisinger said, hey, I can make a lot of money and I can do this very quickly. I can bury two, three hundred guys in a day. We're almost like an assembly line. Do you think there's going to be mistakes? Of course. And so David Wilson understands this. He says, mm -mm, I know you can do more, but you can only um, process 100 or less or fewer um, soldiers' corpses per day. He's very explicit about that. So I mentioned the first body is going to be um, disinterred on the 27th. And there will be some faults, obviously. Are they going to be digging up and burying men during the dedication ceremony on the 19th? Of course not. Um, and also, sometimes when the ground is so frozen, they can't put the shovels into the ground. So they're going to stop during that period. The last body, officially, and they're going to find some others periodically, but officially, the last one is going to be buried on March 18th, 1864. An amazing feat. And who is responsible for this? David Wills. I don't think any other man could have done this. Um, as you can see, about 3,500 burials during this time, an amazing number. Wills is going to report to the legislature that the work was performed with great care and to my entire satisfaction. What's interesting is, just to tell you about this guy, David Wills. Imagine every evening he comes back to his office and there is Townsend, and there is Weaver, and they each have lists of the men that they have processed, and they will cross-check every evening to make sure everything is correct, that there have been no mistakes. That's David Wills. Okay, so David Wills is one of the heroes of the story. Just to summarize uh, some of the things, obviously he's involved in establishing the cemetery, purchasing the land, awarding the contracts, and not only is he awarding the contracts, think about it. How many farmers have found a body off of the battlefield? Maybe, maybe a soldier's been wounded, mortally wounded, and he's crawling away or gets on his horse and falls off and dies a mile or two away. David Wells is going to place um, advertisements in the local newspapers. Have, do you know where some other bodies are, are buried? So he makes sure that he knows as many as he possibly can. As I mentioned, he's going to tally. And the next step, he's got to dedicate the cemetery. And that is the next step. Now, he's going to do something. Now, this is a very shrewd man, David Wills. Um, who does he want more than anybody else to come to this ceremony? Who's going to make it, uh, give it validity and credibility? The president, right? And as we're going to see, presidents don't leave Washington very often. So if he can get one, if he can get Lincoln to the ceremony, that's going to be very, very special. And to help him do that, and also to create the summit of this ceremony, dedication ceremony, he's going to bring in Ward Lehman. Anyone familiar with Ward Lehman? Ward Lehman's an interesting guy. He's considered to be one of Lincoln's best friends. I think Lincoln had lots of best friends. But this is one of them. 
He's an attorney. He's a Republican. When Lincoln was riding the circuit, who would ride with him? Ward Lehman. And oftentimes they'd be sleeping in the same bed together, which was perfectly fine back then. Um, he's a meticulous planner. He's very meticulous. And David Wills has heard this. And so he's going to approach Ward Lehman. How about working for the committee? Now, I should mention that Lincoln has already tapped him early in his presidency. He's already in Washington. He is serving as the marshal of the District of Columbia. So he's already in D.C. Gettysburg isn't that far away. And a lot of the planning he can do from a distance. He doesn't have to be right in Gettysburg. And so one of the reasons that's positive is he's a meticulous planner. Wills didn't have the time to do all of the meticulous planning. But number two in his back pocket is the possibility his best friend might just convince Lincoln to come. Well, who do you need? Obviously, you need an orator. Now, the, the, the problem that David Wills is going to have is how many times is, an, is a cemetery, let alone a national cemetery, dedicated? I mean, when was the last time we heard of a brand new cemetery being born? It doesn't happen very often. And so he has to really explore as many uh, dedications as he possibly can, or not very many of them. And he realizes that the most important part of any dedication is the oration. Um, I don't think we really understand. Like in, uh, Linda and I were, <coughs> excuse me. I'm going to grab that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Linda and I were talking about, oh, I drank your water. This is mine right here. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh -oh. Anyway, today we don't really understand the power of the orator, how important the orator was. Um, but back then, you had to have one, and the more distinguished, the better. And who is the most well-known, most distinguished orator? In the entire country back then, Edward Everett. And talk about a who's who, you couldn't find a more distinguished person. He was governor of Massachusetts. He's pres he was president of Harvard University. He was secretary of state. He was the prime minister, not prime minister, but he was the um, um, ambassador to England. He was secretary of state, I may have mentioned that. If there was a, 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 a position that was important, he filled it. And he will be approached by David Wills to give the oration. He says, yes, I would love to do it, but I can't do it in mid-October when you want to do it. I can do it in mid-November, but not in October. So think about this. You're a part of the committee. The committee is all the 18 agents. And you're trying to weigh which is more important. Because what, what happened yesterday in State College? Or you were mentioning about um, when um, James uh, McPherson came and how cold it was. You know, you never know what it's going to be like, the weather's going to be like in, in mid-November. It could be snowing. It could be freezing. Do you really want to move it from October, where it's probably going to be very nice, to November? They had to weigh that. And they finally said, you know what? This guy has such important, um, he's so well-known and so well-valued, we've got to move it. So that's why they're going to move it to November the 19th, rather than when they were going to do it on the 8th or uh, in October. Um, as I mentioned, he's studying other ceremonies, and he realizes that there are other components that he has to include. He has to have music. People expect music. And again, David Wills is pretty smart. He says, okay, I want Lincoln to come. Who is his favorite band of all? Boom. The Marine Band. Who's he going to invite to the ceremony? The Marine Band. And they will be on the train with Lincoln. And every time that train stops at a platform, they're going to pop off and they're going to serenade the president. Who is the favorite band of the governor of Pennsylvania, Andrew Curtin? Who? Adolph Birdfield from Philadelphia. He's going to be invited. He will accept. And they'll be on the train with Andrew Curtin, every time that train stops, they pop off and they're going to uh, serenade the governor. 
So that makes perfect sense. They're going to be involved. There need to be prayers, obviously, and opening um, invocation. Now, the guy on the left, you probably have never heard of. This is Reverend T.H. Stockton, well known because he's the chaplain of the U.S. House of Representatives. So he's not, you know, he's not hiding in the shadows. They, everybody knew who he was. He was a natural to be invited. But the guy on the right, Henry Balger, who's going to be doing the, the closing benediction, uh, is not as well known across the country. Anybody know who Balger is? He was the president of Pennsylvania College. He's a minister. And this was a tip of the cap to the citizens of Gettysburg who had to persevere through a, a horrible time in their history. Okay, so you got prayers. Now, the big controversy about Lincoln. Everybody on the committee says, yes, we should invite Lincoln to come. And um, he is going to invite, this is David Wills, we'll have two letters, and we have them as the Library of Congress, two letters that he sends to Lincoln on November, dated November 2nd. One of them invites him to come, and the second says, oh, by the way, it's going to be a madhouse here on, uh, during the dedication. You can spend the night in my house. Well, nobody on the committee thought that he was going to accept. And guess what? He says, yeah, I think I'd like to come. That came as a big surprise. So almost immediately, the, the commissioner from Illinois, is, as you can see, Clark Kerr is his name, says, hey, committee, we need to let Lincoln speak. We have to give him a speaking role, right, president? Well, all hell breaks loose at that point. Many on the committee, many of the agents said, uh uh, he should not speak. He should sit in the front row, he should smile, shake hands, wave, but he should not speak. The ceremony is too long as it is. We can't lengthen it anymore. And besides, what if he gets up there and he tells some stupid stories? And some of these stories are off color. He's never done this before. This will be horrible. Who do you think these guys were? These were Democrats. Yeah, these were Democrats. Now think about it. It's 1863. What's happening in 1864? His re-election campaign. If you're a Democrat, do you want to give the president a national platform? No. Well, the Republicans obviously said, we need to let him speak as long as he wishes. And they went back and forth, back and forth. And finally, they're going to come up with a compromise. And he's going to write to Lincoln on the 14th. Thank you. We hope you will be able to come and say a few appropriate remarks. And I always mention this. If I'm president, if you're president, if you're schlepping all the way from Washington, are you going to say a few appropriate remarks? Or are you going to say whatever you want? I'm going to do whatever I want. Heck with you guys. But he actually is going to uh, listen to them and make his remarks probably more meaningful because it was so short. They were so short. Now, there's some controversy about Lincoln and whether he's going to come or not. Um, as you probably know, presidents, unlike today, do not leave the White House. They do not leave Washington. They do not leave the executive mm -hmm. It's just too difficult. Yeah, they're trains, but those trains break down all the time. Cows wander on the tracks and they derail the tracks, the, the, the trains. It's not common. Now, Lincoln will go to Antietam the very beginning of October, second, third, and fourth, but that's just very unusual. And then you have the issue of Mary Todd Lincoln, who the more I, I think about her, the more I, I'm more sympathetic to her than I might have been otherwise. And think about it. Well, before we think about it, he says to Mary, hey, I know that you're not real happy with me. I've not been present at many meals. You don't see me very often. I'm consumed in this war, in this presidency. Why don't we all go as a family? Maybe Robert will come, maybe Tad, you, and we'll all go to Gettysburg together. We'll make it a family out. And she says, yeah, that sounds good. Well, 
what happens, something happens that sort of throws everything off kilter. About November 17th, uh, the baby, Tag, comes down with a form of smallpox. There's some question whether it was variola or not, which is a mild form, but he was definitely very sick. Now, you are Mary Lincoln, okay? Put yourself in her place. You see that young man on the right? You know who that is? That's Edward Lincoln. That's their first child. He's going to die, not even for reaching the age of four years old, of uh, probably cancer. Okay? And then if you look at the illustration, look at the picture. Oh, I get it. I, I have a pointer, don't I? Look at this. You see that little guy right there? That's Willie. What happened to Willie? He, he's going to die of typhoid fever the year before. 1862, you have lost two of your boys. Your baby, Ted, is on his deathbed, possibly. Are you going to get emotional? I get emotional. Are you going to say to uh, Lincoln, you're not, of course, not going? And she did not like the answer. And he was not quite certain he was going, but he felt that fully. He felt like he had to go. But he's going to decide at the last minute, really, to decide to go. Um, okay. Oh, did I go the other? Did I go the other one? <coughs> wait a minute, wait, hold on. I am going the wrong way. Okay. And you taught me how to do it, I still got it wrong. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. <coughs> and I, you know, I, I, as I, I know it's getting a little bit later, I'm okay. Um, the main thing I'm going to do tonight is talk about the dedication and the um, the formation of the cemetery. But let me just mention a few things that are kind of interesting, because there is a part two if you're interested to this talk, and that is just about Lincoln and his visit to Gettysburg. But Edwin Stanton, Secretary of War, had no interest in coming to Gettysburg. He was not going to be here during the dedication. But Lincoln apparently asks him to arrange the itinerary. And apparently because Stanton must have been very meticulous as a planner, and he's going to come up with the, the itinerary. And he says to the president, hey, Mr. President, I know you're busy. I know you don't want to leave the White House. I know you have a sick child. How about you get on a train early in the morning of the 19th, you get to Gettysburg, you do the dedication, you get back on the train, you're back that evening. They don't even know you're gone. And he says, I don't think he says, are you nuts? I would probably say that. Are you nuts? He says, there is, what would happen if the train broke down? And I get there after the dedication ceremony is over. That's not going to work. If I'm going, I'm going to be going the day before. And what makes it difficult is getting from Washington to Gettysburg. You know, we assume it was an easy trek. It was not easy. He's got to take three separate train lines. He's going to get onto the, the train in Washington, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad line. He's going to travel to Baltimore. They're going to detach the locomotive. The cars that he's in are going to be dragged across uh, Baltimore to the Northern Central Railroad, where a new locomotive will be added. They go off to Hanover Junction. Hanover Junction, the same thing's going to happen. And so you can see it's not easy, number one. And number two, it's fraught with the possibility of, of problems, mm -hmm. trains breaking down, et cetera. Uh, this guy on the right, I would not want to have his job. This is James Fry. He's a bureaucrat. He's a general, brigadier general, um, but he's a bureaucrat. And he's been tasked with taking a buggy and going to the White House Executive Mansion and collecting Lincoln and taking him to the train station. Easy, right? Wrong. Lincoln is not interested in going. He's busy. He's signing papers. He's meeting with people. And James Fry is getting more and more anxious. He's starting to pace back and forth in the hallway in front of Lincoln's office. He's really starting to annoy Lincoln. And finally, Lincoln says, come here, sit down. 
He says, I'm going to tell you a little story. I know if you've heard this story. You probably heard the story, right? Um, there was a man on his way to the gallows. They're going to hang him. His hands and feet are bound. And they're taking him, you know, uh, in this cart to the gallows. All of these townspeople are running past full speed. And, he, and the, uh, the, the guy who's about ready to be uh, hung yells out to them, what's your hurry? They're not going to start without me. Same thing. This train isn't going anywhere without Lincoln. So that did placate uh, Fry for at least a little bit. Oh, I did it again. I apologize. I'm going to skip that one. Um, one of the interesting things about his visit, he's going to get to Gettysburg on the, about 6 o'clock on the evening of the 18th, the night before. He's going to walk up to the uh, Will's house. He's going to spend the night there. He's going to have dinner there. He's going to be serenaded there. He's going to go out and give a speech there, which is horrible, because this was a man who could write the most wonderful speech, but if he had to do something impromptu, forget it. Um, he's going to finish writing his Gettysburg Address there. And uh, he's going to try to sleep there, but it's not going to be very successful. But the marshals, the next day, they will insist. Now, the marshals, these are not protective agents. They're simply to keep the peace. And you can tell us. You can tell these uh, marshals because they have a sash. You'll see a couple over here. They have a black frock coat. You don't see their gloves. No one was supposed to be, could be on a buggy or a wagon. You either walked during the procession to the cemetery on the 19th, or you rode a horse, period. Um, so you're going to see a number of these guys around. Now, are you familiar with this? This document? This is an amazing document. And if I were to do this again with Linda, I think I'd blow this up and have each side on one page so you could read it. But think about it. 15,000 people are coming to Gettysburg. It's been viewed, it's been billed as the event of the century. And there are so many people, there's no place for them to sleep. They're, they're, ming they're not mingling, they're just huddled all through the town. Now, when the dedication procession passes, we came from, we came from New York, right? Okay, not too far. Where are you going to be? Are you going to be lining the side of the streets on Baltimore Street and watching the president go by and all these elected officials watching the soldiers march by? Yeah, that's where I would be. Mm -mm. You'll be part of the procession. And so what this is over on the left, and again, this is Ward Lehman, very meticulous. You're going to start off with the military. Where did the military form? On Carlisle Street. And then they're going to be followed each the president, the cabinet members, um, the governors, et cetera, the dog catchers even, well, someone like that is gonna be on there. Uh, very meticulous in terms of uh, the order that they're going to be marching toward the cemetery and they're gonna form on York Street. And the rest of us, we're gonna be on Chambersburg Street and we're gonna be part of the procession. And what's neat is they also have the various states and territories. So Pennsylvania, guess what? We're going to be in the lead. And who's at the very bottom? The Western territories, like California. Who cares? Put them in the back. I don't think they had anybody in California, but what the heck. <clears throat> That's a wonderful document. And then on the other side is the actual um, program. You know, when is going to be the, the, the prayers? When's going to be the oration? When is going to be the, um, the there was an ode? When Lincoln's going to get up, et cetera. All of that is on that side. Just wonderful. Okay. So we're getting close to wrapping this up. And I'm going to leave you in suspense. Okay. And you're going to say to Kate, you've got to have this guy back again to tell us the rest of the story here. 
uh, where was the speaker's platform? For years and years, they thought it was where? In the National Cemetery, right? And then Kathy George, who worked for the Park Service, said, mm -hmm, I'm looking at photographs, it's somewhere else. Where did Lincoln write his Gettysburg Address? How many of you, um, and I always ask this when I give a town tour uh, of Gettysburg and it's a Lincoln tour, I'll say, where did he write his speech? And I get these blanks, especially from younger people. But how many people would say in the audience here that he wrote it on the train or heard that he wrote it on the train? Yes? Yes, because so many young people, they had to read this story from Mary Shipman Andrews. It was, it was fiction. A short story fiction where here's Lincoln on the train and he is going to, he sees a scrap of paper on the, it's an envelope. He pulls it up, he pulls out a pencil, he pulls off his top hat, he uses the top of the top hat to write the speech. He did it on the train, right? Wrong. <clears throat> anyway. Um, Lincoln is going to get up early on the morning of the dedication, and he is going to, with Secretary's, um, um, Secretary of State um, Seward. Seward. Seward, thank you. That's why these guys are right in the front here, because I need help. Uh, with Secretary of Seward, they're going to drive over to the battlefield in a wagon. We don't know where Lincoln went, but he went somewhere on the battlefield. I have an idea, and I think it's, we put that in here. Lincoln rides a horse. Are you familiar with the horse story? Lincoln rides a horse. Uh, some said it was the smallest horse you they ever saw. Lincoln couldn't ride it, they said. And it was, he looked ridiculous. His feet were literally almost touching the ground. Why? Because if he couldn't ride a horse, he didn't know how. If he fell, he wouldn't have to fall so far. <laughs> well, who said this? The Democrats. And the Republicans, he know how to ride a horse. And the Republicans, the biggest, blackest steed you ever saw. Um, was Lincoln ill? It's interesting how few, how, how few of us, I didn't know this, that Lincoln, after he returns from Gettysburg, almost dies. He catches a full-blown case of smallpox. He's going to be in bed for three weeks, and his aides are really covering for him. They didn't want the population to know how sick he really was. Um, but was he ill at Gettysburg? Um, ah, did Lincoln read his remarks? And this is the odd thing. There's so many mysteries. Uh, in our book, we try not to solve the mysteries because we probably would be wrong. So we, we lay out, here's, here's all the rhetoric side. There are some people in the front row who insist he memorized every word. There, was people, there were people right beside that person saying, no, he read the whole thing. Others said he looked down, he looked up. Was there applause? Think about it. The president is speaking. Would you applaud the president? What do you think? He's the president, right? Yeah. But it's a funeral. It's like a funeral. You applauded a funeral? Well, the Associated Press had a stenographer there who was taking, uh, who was writing down every word, and we know whether they applauded or not. Uh, how do people feel about Edward Everett's remarks? Two hours. Can you imagine sitting quietly or standing for two hours as this guy drones on and on? How did people, how did Lincoln view it? I'll give you a hint, Lincoln liked it, by the way. I think he probably slept too hard. In the <laughs> how about Lincoln's remarks? How did he feel about them? How did the general public feel about them? those who heard them? So there are lots and lots of questions um, about his visit. But I should mention 
Uh, just a couple more things before we wrap it up. The other hero in this story is Andrew Kirk, without any question. Uh, as I mentioned, quickly embraced the idea of the cemetery is going to support buying the land for it. Uh, he actually is going to be very influential on getting Lincoln to come. We know he went to Washington, he conferred with Lincoln, and I think part of the reason why he went up there is to say to Lincoln, you got to come. Um, and he's going to be present. In fact, there, there he is. There is Andrew Curtin, and there is his, his son right there. Now, after the, after the ceremony is over, um, there's going to be a few other things. I should mention another hero, unsung hero, is this lady right here. This is David Wills' wife, Catherine Smizer Wills. And I want you to imagine she's got three, baby, three young children. She's pregnant with a fourth. And David Wills says, oh, by the way, Catherine, the president is going to spend the night here. Oh, and there's 36 people coming for supper. <laughs> Not a problem, right? And she handles it effortlessly. Uh, she's going to provide breakfast to the president. And think about it. After, you know, the, the ceremony starts, the procession is supposed to start at 10. The ceremony is over at about 2. If you're Lincoln, what do you want to do? Lunch. You go back to the Wills house and she'll prepare lunch for him. And then he goes to the Presbyterian Church. Why would, what religion, organized religion was Lincoln? He didn't have any. He did not believe in organized, at least personally, he did not embrace organized religion. He was very spiritual, but he's going to visit the Presbyterian Church. Why? If he's starting to feel a little bit under the weather. One of the, one of the early impacts of, of smallpox is extreme fatigue. He's starting to feel fatigue. He wants to go back to Washington, but he's going to go to the Presbyterian Church. Why? Anyone? It's a political thing because then the governor elect or something was speaking at the, That's at the correct. Presbyterian Church. The state of Ohio had a big affair. Very good. Thank you. So it was a political rally. The state of, of Ohio had rented the Presbyterian Church. The governor was there, Governor Todd, the lieutenant governor, the governor-elect congressman. They came to the ceremony and they had a political rally. They are, it's a Republican state. And Lincoln, who's very smart, says, who helped me get elected in 1860? Ohio. Who do I need next year? Ohio. Where am I going to be even though I don't feel so great? right at that Presbyterian church. And he's going to be not alone. He's sitting next to Burns. Right, John Burns. Another brilliant move. He's going to rub shoulders and elbows with the national hero. And then he's going to, somebody falls asleep during, the, uh, during this political rally. Now, everybody assumes it is John Burns. He's 69 years old. He's an old guy. I'm not so certain it was John Burns who fell asleep during the ceremony. If you're coming down with, if number one, you had an arduous trip to get to Gettysburg, you probably didn't sleep the night before. You're coming down with this dreadful disease. I think if I'm Lincoln, I'm probably falling asleep, but we don't know. They never really talk about who fell asleep. But uh, but Lincoln will get a tap on the shoulder about six thirty that evening, saying, "Mr. President." Your train is ready to depart. And he's quite a mensch. He's going to go not right to the train station on Carlisle Street. Where is he going to go first? To the Wills house to thank Mr. and Mrs. Wills for their hospitality. He's going to get back on the train and he's going to go back home. And then while he's there, he's going to get a telegram from the White House executive mansion telling him that Tad is doing better. So he's feeling better. And that telegram comes on the evening before, on the, the evening of the 18th. Oh, I did it again. So that just gives you a, a, a flavor of some of the challenges. And hopefully you all have an opportunity to visit the cemetery again in the future. And maybe think a little, a few things about what we mentioned. Um, but it, it's just a fascinating story. Does anyone have any questions?
Yes, in the back here. What was the arrangement with Basil Biggs? Um, Basil Biggs, I believe, was part of the uh, the. He's a teamster, and he's going to be involved with uh, with um, Weaver in terms of digging up the body. So he has a role. I don't think it's a major role. Um, I think he may have been involved in working with the crew of people of color who were actually digging up the bodies. Um, so it was more of a supervisory role than anything else. It was a dollar fifty nine per body. Yes. Uh, supposedly Basil Biggs got a dollar twenty five per body and then bought a farm. He did get money. I'm not I'm not familiar. actually Oh, I should be repeating the questions for those of you who are watching. Uh, the question is about Basil Biggs, um, his role during the the um, process. Um, he did buy a farm after it, but he was he was doing very well. He was a teamster working for Thaddy Stevens for many years. I I would put a question that he was making so much money uh, for each body. If it's only a dollar fifty nine, he's I can't imagine he's getting a dollar twenty-five of it. So, um, what what you learn when you start to dig into the literature is the contradictions. And one of the things that we would not do, and Linda uh, agreed with me, we, we would go back and forth sometimes. There were people like Daniel Skelly, like Albertus um, McCreary. You've probably heard of these young men. They were young, they were teenagers during Lincoln's visit during the battle. And they're gonna write their recollections in, I think, um, McCreary, I think it was like the 1930s, his article came out. Daniel Skelly is gonna be um, still the early part of the, the, the 1900s. They will recount like it was yesterday what happened. And in both cases, they rubbed shoulders, they, they shook hands, they were right there. Um, that says we didn't use any non-period accounts. We used letters and diaries, newspaper accounts, because this is such a seminal event. Think about it. You, you shook hands. You were a buddy with JFK. Bless you. JFK came to York, Pennsylvania, and uh, you had a nice conversation with him. How do people feel about you? They think, whoa. He spoke to James May. He had a conversation with him. And I think that's part of it. You know, part of it was memory changes. Part of it is, hey, my stature will grow because if I can say that I was right there, he, he tapped me on the head, he shook my hand. We don't know. And because of that, we didn't include it in the book. Same thing with Basil. So possibly, it just doesn't seem quite right. I think there are some other questions maybe. How about Kate? I was just going to ask you, is there really a part two to this talk? There is a part two. Can you just give us a little brief summary of what that Well, was? basically, it's a lot of the questions. We talked about um, in part two, it gets to more along the lines of, I'm trying to remember now. I've only given it once. You got me on the spot here. A lot of the question marks that we talked about. But you said it was more about Lincoln? It's, it's all about Lincoln. Oh, that would be really interesting. Yes, it's all about Lincoln. Um, I mean, it's just fascinating. For instance, you know, we all know obviously that Lincoln was assassinated. Um, there was supposed to be someone guarding his box. Were there any guards at Lincoln's uh, at the Wills house? You know, interesting. I mean, we know that what there was, they, they, there were, and we know who they were. Um, we talk about where did he go on the battlefield? We talk about um, where. Um, well, for instance, to answer that question, was there a cross? You know, and, and um, so those kinds of things, and a lot more illustrations as well. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's, yes, in front you of mentioned Lincoln took a trip over the battlefield that morning. Mm -hmm. Yet Nicolay claims he went to Lincoln's room at breakfast time, and Lincoln was there working on his speech. Nicolay says he never rode around the battlefield. Right. Nicolay also, along with Hay, um, indicated things that others did not agree with. So, you know, again, it's a matter of judging. We know there, there are many accounts where Lincoln, 
We know Lincoln did go into the battlefield. Um, maybe when he was was there, uh, Lincoln had returned. You know that doesn't that doesn't preclude him from actually having been on the battlefield. Also, I'm not so certain that Lincoln was still working on that speech that morning. Uh, he went to see Seward that evening with the speech basically finished to get his uh, his opinion and evaluation of it. But again, a mystery, you know, and that's what's so fascinating. We want everything to be cut and dry. It isn't. And it, it's it's so I'm not going to argue with anyone in terms of, well, I heard differently or it could it could be. We just don't know. But it's a very good point. Yes, please. The photograph that you had of the marshals, can you go back to that and try to point out Lincoln? Uh, Lincoln isn't in this one. Yes, he is. Oh, is he? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go see. Mm -hmm. yeah, there he is. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. He is. So Lincoln is going to be right over here. You can see him right over there. Not wearing his top hat. Oh, yeah. You see that? Supposedly landing to the right with the beard. Yeah. yeah. And you think over here? No, no. Yeah. Right up like over here. Right here. No, I don't know. Just, yeah, I, I it could be. That. He here's. I think this is French, who also worked with. Uh, if you look at photographs, I can't remember his first name, but he uh, French was his right hand man, and to me, he looks a little bit more like um, like Ward Lehman, and that definitely looks like French. But um, like this. it's it's possible. It's possible. Any other questions you might have? Yes. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. What when was the uh, section second session section of uh, the battlefield added? Oh, you mean other graves? Yeah. So that's going to be happening after. Um, I don't have the actual date. You know, we concentrated mainly on the development of the cemetery. The question is, when would the other section? You know, you go into the National Cemetery. It's not just the Civil War graves. You see uh, men from who fought in other bat other wars, and I think that's going to be developing later on, obviously, but not around this time. Yes, in the back there. Uh, first of all, Brad, thank you for a great talk and, and a great book. Uh, thank you. To the white um, two two quick questions. Uh, Lincoln, I feel like he went around the battlefield that he probably visited. Reynolds Grave. Yes, that's we we agree. You know, he's, he's a Pen Pennsylvanian. Uh, you've got honor of Pennsylvania, but he's also the highest ranking general. You know that that died. Right. Uh, it, it would be remiss of him to not visit that grave. Well, that it's true. So so the issue is where did Lincoln go on the battlefield? We're on the same page. He probably went to the area where Reynolds was killed. But there's another reason. Think about it. When you walk out of the Wills house, you get on a wagon, you go down Chambersburg Street, uh, you know, uh, the grave is, is not over uh, his, his, where he was mortally wounded is right there uh, outside of the, um, the town. So he didn't have to go all the way down Little Round Top or, you know, other areas. So uh, we would agree with that. Any other questions? Yes, Kate. I just have a Question that I was just kind of curious. You have a PhD in zoology, mm -hmm. but yet you were so successful. You've been writing civil war books for over 30 years. You know, you started one and started. When did you switch gears on uh, from zoology to I went astray. Uh -huh. I'm, a, uh, I'm a field ornithologist, uh, avian ecologist, ecologist. And my work, my field work to get me these, uh, the doctorate was to be out in the field you know, observing, doing um, tests, you know, hypotheses, the, the scientific method. And it was great, um, wasn't married, didn't have a family, had plenty of time to do it. I was young, you know, I was in my early 20s. And then I become a faculty member after I get the doctorate, have young children um, and more responsibilities as a faculty member. I didn't have the time to really spend out in the field, but what? But I have this inquiring mind, and I was always interested in history. So this allowed me, and, and people would say, well, how can a college president write all these books? 
And I would get up at three o'clock in the morning, and that's when I would write. And you can't go out and do field research at three o'clock in the morning anyway in the dark. So it gave me the opportunity to still write and still do research because this to me is as every much as much as it's every much as research as you know zoology or any other parts of science. So that's why I got into it. And I just it, it's it's funny. Many of us are retired, right? I'm assuming. Okay. So I'm gonna help me out here. When I retired, I had a board member who I said to the board member, listen, I drive fast, I do everything fast, I get up three o'clock in the morning. I said, when I retire, I'm just gonna take it easy. I'm gonna drive slower. I'm gonna be more methodical. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna sleep in. I'm not gonna get up at three in the morning. He says, no, you're not. You're bred and that's who you are. And guess what? I still get up three in the morning. Sometimes, sometimes one in the morning. The difference is I'll go back and take a little nap. But how about the rest of you who are retired? Have you changed that much in terms of routine? I mean, you're still who you are, right? So to answer your question, hopefully that answered it, but thank you for that. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah, this picture here, that platform was had three rows of chairs, 10 chairs across, right? And a little table in the back where the reporters were. Mm -hmm. So far in all the research that I've done, I run across 63 people that said they were on that platform. Do you ever run across, <laughs> is there anywhere you can find out who was actually on the platform? That's very, very difficult. The question is, how do we know how many were on the platform? All I know is this, when the committee was designing, David Wills and Ward Lehman were designing the speaker platform, they wanted it to be the size that could hold 30 individuals. Right. Uh, and it's another case of people saying, oh, I was up on stage with Lincoln. And, you know, it, it, it's interesting. And uh, I think I have a one here. Yeah. Um, if you look at the stage, you see a number of women up on that stage. There was two women from Philadelphia. Their names were Gilbert. I never found out why they were on the stage. And there's some question about if they even were on the stage, oh. you know? Because I mean, times have changed. But back then, it was a very male-oriented society, as we know. But you got lots of women on that stage. And, you know, again, it's one of the mysteries. If they were there and who they were and why they were there, no question about it. For the book that we wrote, you know, again, what you're mentioning is very fascinating, but you're looking at a book like this. You know, we wanted a book that would be like this, that would give the overview, but not get drilled down into, you know, where are people sitting and uh, who's up on the stage. Important, but not what we wanted to do. I just finished reading a book about Lincoln at Gettysburg and Saunders, as important as he was, he had a seat on the stage. Yes. But he had no place to sleep. It said he sat in a chair in a parlor. Right. He spent the night in a chair in a parlor. He had no place to sleep. Well, that's the other piece in terms of Kate. Well, one of the things I mentioned is Edward. Ever Imagine here you are. Um, you're Edward Everett, and you're sleeping. You know where I'm going with this. You're sleeping in your bed. It's about midnight, and there's a knock on the door, and there's David, and there's David Wills. And he says, "Excuse me." The governor has just gotten into town. His train broke down. He has no place to sleep. Can he share your bed? <laughs> well, David, um, Edward Everett was not very happy about that. And I can tell you that he did not share Edward Everett's bed. And there's a reason that I'll talk about if you invite me back, um, why we think he would not want um, the governor to be sleeping next to him in his bed. But a horrible, it was a horrible for uh, Edward Everett. He, he felt he was put in a very difficult position. Any other questions? I can go on all night, <laughs> but thank you. I appreciate the invitation. Thank you, Kate. I think this is, I think this is somebody's. No, I, I Oh, okay. Uh, thanks. Thank you.